What would you think about a person who was very, very wealthy and yet was always complaining about not having enough? And you look at them and uh, you think, wait a minute, nobody's wealthy, but look how he dresses. Or look what he drives. Look where he lives. You wonder, well, it doesn't quite match. In other words, if, he's, if he has all of that, why does he act the way he acts? And so you have to ask yourself the question, well, does he not know that he's wealthy? Does he not believe that he's wealthy? Does he not know how to cash in on his wealth? What's wrong with a person who lives that kind of life? Well, something definitely is wrong. But I know a lot of believers who are the same way. They are very wealthy. But they don't act like it. They don't claim it. I think because they don't believe it, because either they've never been taught, or somewhere along the way they miss this awesome truth. And when I think about how clear God has made His Word, and the awesome way He has provided for us, and yet people oftentimes act like they're paupers. Or act like, you know, I'll just never have enough. God's left me out. Uh, God, God, God doesn't understand wh what my needs are. I know that's what the Bible says, but it's not working for me. Well, what's the problem? Is the problem with God? Or is the problem with the fact that I don't understand what I have? So I want you to listen very carefully. It'll change your way you think about yourself and maybe the way you think about God. So I want you to turn to the little book of 2 Peter and look, if you will, in chapter 1. And this is the second uh, message in our series on uh, the promises of God. And we talked last week about why uh, we can trust His promises. And in order to trust someone's promises, you have to look at their character, first of all, and then you look at their ability to fulfill what they promise. And we saw then looking at the attributes of God that He certainly has the right character. He's always going to be truthful and faithful and so forth. And certainly He has the ability because He has all power and all might. And in this particular passage of Scripture, Peter describes this awesome wealth that you and I have. Listen to what he says. Beginning in verse 1 of this first chapter of Second Peter, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now watch these next two verses. Seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him, of Jesus, who called us by His own, listen, by His own glory and excellence. For by these He has granted to us His precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in this world by lust. Now, it's these last two verses I want us to look at for a moment when He says that his divine power has granted us something. That is, has gifted us something. What's that gift? He says everything we need uh, in, to live a godly life. And when he says, look, he has granted to us, he uses a form of the verb which means that has granted to us in the past, and what he has granted to us in the past is still going on. It is called a passive participle. Something happened in the past and still going on. So God has granted to every single one of His children something that is still going on in their life. And what that is, is He, noted, he mentions here these precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in this world by lust. And what He's simply saying is this, you and I trust that Jesus Christ is our Savior. We took upon ourselves the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't mean that we're exactly like Him, but we have Him living on the inside of us. Now think about this for a moment. If you have Jesus on the inside of you, which He talks about abiding in Him and, and He's abiding in us, and as Paul talks about Christ in us, our hope of glory. If Jesus Christ is abiding in me, living in me, then I have 
the most valuable thing possible on the inside of me. And he puts it in this way. He, he, speaks, of, he speaks of promises and describes them as precious and magnificent. Now, if something is precious, that means it's, it's very valuable, of course. And uh, if it's magnificent, it, it's superb. It, it's, it's beyond what is ordinary by far. And it's splendid and it's noble. And when he talks about something uh, being uh, precious and then being magnificent, uh, we, we're talking about the precious, something precious is something I cherish, I adore, I take care of it. And so he's simply saying this, that every single believer has this possession we have the promises of God within us, and these promises from God's viewpoint are very precious, and they are magnificent. Now, the question is this. Why should we believe that the promises of God can be described this way, that they are promises that are cherishable, magnificent, precious? Why? And so most of this message is going to be answering that simple question. And first of all, I would simply say that one of the primary reasons that they are cherishable, magnificent, and precious is who gave them. All the promises in the Word of God came from Almighty God. He never gives anything that's second rate. He doesn't almost do anything. He didn't sort of create the world, but perfect design in every single aspect of it. So it is in your life and mine. He doesn't do things halfway. He does them completely beautifully, magnificently. And the problem is we don't get that message oftentimes. And so when we talk about his promises falling in that category, then here's what it says to me. That means if I have these promises, I have something extremely valuable to me personally because his promises are given to every single one of his children. Once you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it's this awesome sense of wealth that comes with that that most people will never recognize. In fact, most people are going to live out their lives, and they're going to come toward the end of it, and here's what they're going to start saying. If I'd have, if I'd have just made that decision, if I'd have taken that job, if I'd have taken that direction, if I'd have said this, if I had not done that, if I had not moved, if I had not made that decision, so it's if I, if I'd have done this, if I'd have done that, if I'd have done the other. And you don't have to come to the end of your life to start thinking that. I meet people all the time. And of course, the conversation, if that conversation is long enough, somewhere along the way, if we get to talking about spiritual things, they're going to bring up this whole, whole idea, well, if I'd have this, and if I'd have that, and, and I wish this, and wish that. And so what you have to ask is this. How do you want to live out your life? How do you want to come to the end of your life? And I'm going to show you a wonderful passage in a moment. How do you want to come to the end of your life? Thanking God for what He's done in your life. Thanking God for what He allowed you to do. Are you going to come to the end of your life and think, why, why, if out of this and if out of that? that that's, that's the story of a defeated man or woman. And so what I want you to see in this passage of Scripture and in all these passages is this. Watch this carefully. I know that many of you are not going to believe this. But listen carefully. Whether you know it or not, the day you received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you became this awesome, wealthy person. They say, well, but why, why, am I, why am I where I am financially? I don't know. Maybe you made some decisions that weren't very wise. But let's just scratch the material things for a moment. When you think about what you own and what your wealth is, where, where is your wealth? Is it in your family? Is it in your material possessions? Are you wise enough to recognize that your wealth is in a form and a fashion that no one can take from you? You will never be able to spend it all. That it's there given to you by God. And it's given to you by God, which he will never change. Because the moment you trusted him as your savior, you inherited something. You became a child of God. And with that decision of becoming a child of God, you became a very valuable person. Now, where is all this value? Here's where it is. It's in the promises of God. And I'm going to show you in a few moments why I say that. That when you trusted Him as your Savior, the promises of the Word of God became your promises. You are a very wealthy person. And there are many believers who think 
when they look at their lives, they talk about what they don't have and they wish this and God hadn't answered this prayer and so forth. There's a reason they're thinking what they're thinking. What I want you to see is this simple truth. How wealthy you are as a child of God by the gift of His magnificent and precious promises. They're yours, but you must cash in on. For example, you could be a multimillionaire, have a big checkbook, and you could write a check for anything you wanted. But if you just took the checkbook and you looked at it and you played with it and you ripped this one out and you filled out this one, filled out that and threw it in the trash can, and, and you just sort of played with the checkbook, you could starve to death because you don't cash in on what's yours. The money's in the bank under your name. And you talk about it. You tell other people about it. But you never present the check. And you never cash in on it. Listen carefully. As a child of God, your life has been bequeathed. And, and when he says in this passage, granted to you these awesome, precious promises of his. Magnificent promises. Then the question is this. What is all that? In other words, it's like walking to this treasure chest and opening it and saying, wow, I didn't know that I had all of this. So what I'd like to do is simply tell you what you have. Now, one of the messages I want to preach about is simply this, and that is, how do you claim a promise? That's coming later. Right now, I want you to see what is at your disposal, what is before you to be enjoyed, to be claimed, to call upon. And you have to ask yourself the question, number one, do I believe this? And secondly, how do I claim it? So let's think about it for a moment. And let's begin where God begins in all of our lives. And I'm going to put on the screen here, there are quite a number of these. I'm going to, I'm going to watch this. I'm going to show you how wealthy you are. Because every single one of these promises just shows you more how much more wealthy you are than you think. Now watch this carefully. You'll sit here or out there, and the devil will say to you, oh, you know what, that's just some sermon about something in the Bible, correct? But you have to make up your mind whether you want God's best or you want to keep living in poverty. If you're wise, you'll listen carefully. And you'll write down what's going to be on the screen because it'll be very simple from this point on. And you can follow. So let's begin with the first evidence of God's wealth that he's bequeathed to you. So I want you to turn, if you will, to Romans chapter 5 for a moment. And we'll be going through a number of scriptures. Romans chapter 5 tells us how it all starts. And here's what he says. He says in verse 6, But while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. But one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrated his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by, the, by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Now watch this. When you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, He forgave you of all your sins. He brought you into a relationship with Himself, a personal relationship, that from that point on, watch this, you can call yourself a child of God. That is your possession. You now have a heritage, and that heritage is that God is your Father. Jesus Christ is your Savior, your brother, and you are now a member of the family of God. That's who you are. You cease to be who you used to be, a child of the devil. You are now a child of God, number one. Very important. And until that happens, nothing else that I'm going to say would apply to you. But that's the beginning, and that's the foundation. When I talk, here, listen to Christians talk oftentimes, and I'll say, have you ever been saved? Uh, yes, I have. Oh, what about your Christian life? Oh, I don't know. Somewhere back yonder, this, that, and the other. They don't even realize what happened to them. God invited them into his family, 
and now calls them a follower of Jesus. That is an awesome heritage and a promise from God. Now, that's one thing. So let's think about it in this light also. We're talking about, let's talk about the wealth that you have. The second thing I want you to notice is this. Not only did he save you and forgive you and cleanse you and write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life, make you a part of the kingdom, but he gave you this promise. And this promise is in 1 John 1, 9. You all know it by heart. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What an awesome promise. Here's what that means. It means that as I live out my life in this filthy, dirty world, I can stay clean every day. Because he says if we confess our sins, he's faithful. That is, you can trust him. Faithful and just, he has the right to do it. Forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from every unrighteous thing. That says, I am very wealthy, that I have the privilege of going to God Almighty, asking him, Lord, this is in my life. It shouldn't be. I recognize it. I acknowledge it. And I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins. That is an awesome possession. A third part of that wealth is simply this, and that is his, con his continued presence in our life. Think about this. Who else can promise you this? This is the sovereign God of the universe who says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. There in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. I will never leave you nor forsake you. You know what that says? See if you can match this. You have a traveling companion in the person of Jesus Christ who will never, under any condition, no matter what, ever desert you or forsake you, period. Now, who can promise you that? Nobody can promise you that. And you see, it's when people turn their eyes away from the Lord God, and when they start looking at their, themselves and their situation and circumstances, instead of asking, what's the promise of the Father? The promise of the Father is, you, listen, once you trust Jesus as your Savior, you can't ever be alone. You may want to be, you can't be. He says, I will, not, I will not forsake you. No, never desert you under any condition. That is an unconditional promise of God that belongs to every believer. And listen, nobody can change that. You could go to prison or you could be here, you could be there. doesn't make a difference. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll never desert you, period. So the next time you get down in the mouth and you're alone and you think, I need a counsel, I need this, oh, God, help me, just stop and ask yourself the question. Now, what is that I possess? I possess Jesus as my intimate friend who lives on the inside of me and who promised that no matter what goes on in my life, he will never leave me. You can't beat that for a promise or for friendship. That is an awesome possession which no one else can give you and no one else can promise you that. Then, of course, he promises us that we don't even have to live this life in our own strength and power. But we have the Holy Spirit who is called our helper. There in John chapter 14, verse 16. When he says, I'm going to send you a helper. And when he comes, he talks about what he will do for us. When he calls you to serve him, you have the Holy Spirit to enable you. To give you wisdom and direction and guidance for your life. And to empower you in order to do well to do good, whatever he calls you to do. Nobody else can do that. Listen, people, and oftentimes pastors, and when they fall in this trap, they go on their eloquence and they go on their education and all these things. The truth is, none of us has anything to say apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of God that takes the Word of God that drives it home to people's hearts. You have, watch this, you have the third person of the Trinity living on the inside of you. Listen, and you have his guarantee that he will never leave you, and he will empower you to do anything and everything God calls you to do, whether that's being a godly mother of your children or being the president of a corporation. Doesn't make any difference what it is. That's his promise. And it's these promises that make you wealthy. So far, you've not heard anything that I've said that anybody else can provide for you other than God because of your relationship to him. Then, of course, there's the whole issue of God's strength. And there are lots of verses in here about, about all of these. But if you'll notice in this uh, 41st chapter of Isaiah, listen to what he says. He says, you're my servant. I've chosen you and not rejected you. Do not fear, for I'm with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I'm your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. I will strengthen you. Listen, 
what that promise is, the, the promise of God's strength. All of us come to those times in our life when we feel weak, or we don't feel like we can manage, or we don't feel like we can make it. He says, I will strengthen you. Now, if your friends promise you that, uh, that just depends on what they can do. But listen, when the sovereign of the universe, who has all power and all might, gives you this wondrous, precious, magnificent promise, I will strengthen you. I can tell you, that is a promise no one else can promise you, but it is an awesome, magnificent promise. I think of it a few times, probably a lot of times, in the ministry, when maybe the week's been very, very full and studied and prayed and all the rest, and, and yet uh, come Sunday morning, maybe I'll be a little tired. Or, for example, if I've had a flu or something like that, and thank God I haven't had that in many, many years, but I can remember the times that I have and thank God I can hardly get dressed and somehow think, oh, Jesus, you're going to have to help me. And I'm telling him what kind of shape I'm in. And I've done my best all week and pity party, this, that, and the other. Walk out on the platform. It's like all that disappears and the power of God's all over the place. That can only be God doing what he says. I will strengthen you. Listen, that's your possession. It's a promise. Listen, and you say, well, I'm not sure God will do that for me. He doesn't, make, he doesn't make exceptions. Now, if you're living in sin, it doesn't mean God won't strengthen you, but what you do, you foul up the issue. But he says, I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will undergird you. I will be for you whatever you need. Then he says, for example, that he'll supply all of our needs. Who can promise you that? Not one person. So there are lots of verses in the Bible about that, but probably one of the most valuable ones is in the sixth chapter of Matthew. For this reason, I said to you, don't be worried about your life as to what you're going to eat or what you will drink or for your body as to what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and your body more than clothing? He talks about the birds of the air and the lilies of the field and all the rest. And then he comes down and he says, do not worry then saying, what will you eat? What will you drink? What will you wear for your clothing? He says, the unbelievers think about these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. So what is he saying? Here's his promise to do what? To meet our daily needs. Who else can promise you that? Nobody. He said, well, my, they, these folks. No, 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 no. Nobody can promise you that they're going to answer your prayer, but the Almighty God. Nobody can promise you that whatever the situation, the circumstance that you're in, whatever you need you have, here's the promise. He says he knows what the need is, and he will provide that need no matter what. And so what about this whole issue of answered prayer? Who can promise you that they'll answer your prayer? Oh, somebody may be able to help you in some issue, but listen to what he says in 1 John chapter uh, 5, 14, 15. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that we have the petition that we desired of him. Who can promise you that? No one else. And there are many, many verses of promise, answered prayer in the word of God. But watch this. People say, well, I have needs. Are you cashing in? You know, what, what need do you have? Well, how do I cash in? Well, prayer is certainly one of the ways. And so oftentimes we feel needy and we want somebody else to meet the need. Or we think, I don't know how God's going to work this out. Here's the promise. This is the confidence that you have in him. And so he makes the crystal clear. For example, he says, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. So there's promise after promise after promise of answered prayer. Therefore, if you don't have what you need, it's because you are not claiming for yourself what he has very clearly promised in the Word of God. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, so he's there. And you, you, so your loneliness, he can handle that. Whether the material needs you have, he makes a promise that he will absolutely supply that need. You see, we're not living, we're not living on the path that God wants us to live because we're thinking about other things. He says, I want you to see what you possess. This is what you have in you. This is what you have now. That you have, you have the privilege. You have access to God the Father who will hear your petition, your cry, whatever it might be. Then he, answer, he gives us this awesome passage in the 84th Psalm. Look at this for a moment. Love this 84th Psalm because of what he promises. 
and the way uh, God has said it in this particular passage. He says, uh, for all of his children, this only applies to his children. He says in verse 11 of the 84th Psalm, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. Now watch this. No good thing, watch that, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Look at that promise. Nobody can promise you that. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. That is a possession you have, that every single solitary thing that you need, God has already provided for. And he says none of that, he won't withhold it from you if you walk uprightly. That's one of those promises that's conditional. That is, if you walk live a godly life, whatever you need, he says he will not hold any, withhold any good thing from you. So ask yourself th today, what is it that you need in your life? Or where do you go? Well, God says, I won't withhold it from you if you'll trust me and you'll walk in my way and, and, you, and you will walk in, in a godly life. So then he says, and if you look at the 68th Psalm, and I want you to notice uh, again, all of us have needs in our life. God knows about every single one of them. And here's what he says in this 68th Psalm, speaking of the burdens and so forth that we bear. All of us have burdens we bear in life. And here's what he says in verse 19. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears our burdens. Listen, the God who is our salvation. There are people who wake up every morning. And if you could see them internally, this is the way they wake up. They're bent over with burdens, heartaches and trials in their life they can't handle. Listen to what he says. He says, daily the Lord bears our burden. That's a promise we have. We, listen, we don't have to go through any single day of our life carrying burdens and heartaches. If somebody says, well, how much, how much, how much weight can you bear? Watch this. I can, I can put a few pounds right here. But lift a few pounds off, listen, lift a few pounds off my shoulders. You can put 2,000 pounds on my back as long as it's a quarter of an inch off my body. You can't come up with any amount of burden that God can't handle. He's the burden bearer. And here's what he says. This is how rich you are. You have a relationship to God. And here's what he says. I will bear every single, I will bear every single burden that you have. And listen to this. He didn't say once in a while. He said, blessed is the Lord who daily bears our burden. The God who is our salvation. Jehovah, Yahweh, Elohim. This is, this is the God of this universe. And he says, I'll bear your burden. I don't know what you're dealing with right now. But here's what he says. Whatever burden you're dealing with, he's the burden bearer. You say, well, how do, I, how do I give it to God? You bring it before him. You lay it before him. And we'll talk about that. How do you claim it? Listen, it is not his will for his people to be down in the dumps and discouraged and living with frown on their face. He talks about the joy of the Lord. And we're to have that joy. As long as I'm bearing down with all kinds of things and all kinds of weight in my life and frustrations and anxieties and worries, suppose this, suppose that, I can't have any joy in my life. You don't have to live that way. That's a promise from God. Then, of course, he says that uh, whenever you and I are troubled, he will comfort us. We have a comforter in 2 Corinthians and uh, that first chapter. And no notice what he says. Here. And, and the reason he says this, he says, for example, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, not some of it, in all of our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort others, those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. That is, no matter what you're facing in life, and all of us go through those trying times, he says he's the great comforter. Now watch this. He is absolutely omniscient. He knows all about what, I'm, what I need comfort about. He is omnipotent. He has all the power necessary to comfort me. And we could go right down the list of his awesome attributes. Think about this. When we go through those difficult times, we want to talk to somebody who understands us. He says, he's the great comforter. And he will comfort us in, listen, in every affliction, whatever it might be. That's part of our possession. 
And this is what he called the Holy Spirit, parakletos, which means the one who walks by my side. So God who is living within me in the, in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, he knows what I'm troubled about. He knows what brings me sorrow and heartache and regret or whatever it might be. He says, here's one of my promises to you. I'll be there and I will comfort you no matter what. And I've seen that happen in so many people's lives in different circumstances when all of a sudden they come to this passage and they let me sort of explain it to them a little bit. And they say, oh, you mean, you mean God will take this off me? Yes, he will. He promises that no matter what you and I are going through, whatever trial, he sets a limitation on it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Look at that. He says, no temptation has taken you, but such is his common demand. That is any temptation or trial. And he says, uh, but God is faithful. Now watch this. He says, but such is his common demand, and God is faithful. That means you can trust him. You can depend upon him. Who will not, watch this, who will not allow you to be tempted or tried beyond what you're able, but we're with the temptation. He'll provide the way of escape so that you and I can endure it. Here's what that means. You and I hit those temptations, those trials in our life. And we think, God, I can't handle this. I don't know what I'm going to do about this. God, why do you let these things happen? You know, we, we claim our promise. What's the promise? Here's what he said. If anybody else promised you this, you could doubt it. But God says, I will not allow you to be tempted and tried more than you are able to bear. Now, that is only to a believer. What you can bear because of your relationship to him, why? Well, first of all, you have the Holy Spirit living on inside of you. One of his responsibilities is to comfort us, to give us direction for our life. And so when it comes to meeting those issues and trials, we say, oh, but God, you tempted me. No, he didn't. Lord, why did you let this happen to me? Maybe he wants to show you something. And he says, mark it down. You have this possession. This is, this is a promise that's yours if you claim it. It's yours whether you claim it or not. But it's yours in action. It's yours as an absolute promise of God. I have set a limitation on everything you have to face in life. Now, that is a very encouraging word to people who are going through difficult situations in their life. And then he says, for example, that he will grant us wisdom. In, um, in James, uh, if you will notice in that first chapter, uh, he, he makes the promise of wisdom. Listen to what he says. For if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all people generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Somebody says, well, I don't know what to do. Well, listen, you may not know what to do. Do you want wisdom? You, you have the promise of wisdom. Watch this. A promise of God says that all of the sovereign power of God is behind what he promises, and he will make it work. You need wisdom. That is, you need to see things from God's perspective. You need, you need to make a wise decision here. You, you, you have that promise that he will grant you wisdom in every circumstance of life because that's who he is. You have the wisdom of God dwelling within you. Now, if you're living in sin, here's what that does. It confuses the issue. And you listen, you'll not be able listen. Here's what sin does. Sin does what? Sin crowds out the truth of the living God. And it's not that it's not there. It's that you don't know how to seek his wisdom. Or secondly, you don't believe that God is absolutely sufficient for that. And this is what the devil always does. The devil wants to create doubt. If he, can, if he can create doubt within you, then he's won a victory over you. Does that mean you've lost the promise? No. The fact is you refuse to claim the promise. And so what happens is you make very unwise decisions, and then people say, well, well uh, God should have stopped it. No, God has offered you wisdom. That's a promise from him. Listen, in every single solitary situation, you have a promise from God that he will give you wisdom to know how to respond or how to react in that given situation. That's one of the things that makes us wealthy. Tell me anything any more valuable than wisdom. Seeing things from God's perspective and knowing how to walk in it. And then, of course, he promises us rest in this 11th chapter of uh, Matthew. Uh, notice what Jesus said in those days. He said, come unto me all, come unto me all you who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Take my teachings, my learning upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and humble in spirit 
and you'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. All of us find ourselves in those situations where we need, we need, listen, not just physical rest, but emotional rest. We, we, we need to be able to rest on the inside. What does he say? He says, come unto me, and he says, I'll give it to you. Here's what I want you to see. Deposited within these bodies of ours and these minds of ours is every single solitary thing we need given to us as a promise from Almighty God. That no matter what's happening, he's there to make that provision, whatever it might be. Then we come to this whole issue uh, of peace. And uh, in uh, the, the passage that most of us know by heart in Philippians, listen to what Paul says. He says, now, re rejoice in the Lord. He says, let your, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing. They don't, don't get upset about these things. But in everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What is he saying? He says this. No matter what's going on in your life, God will give you a garrison, a wall that will separate you from anxiety. That will, listen that will fulfill your need of peace in your life. Why, what did Jesus say? The Bible says that Jesus is our peace. Who's living on the inside of you? The Lord Jesus Christ. And so we go through situations and circumstances. Sometimes we hear bad news and frightening news, or whatever it might be. Well, where do we get our peace from? Oftentimes it's not from our friends, not from the doctor, not from the banker, not from this. It's from him. But think about this. Your peace isn't something you get from him, her, and them. Your peace abides within you. It is an indwelling promise of God. What did Jesus say? My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. One of the most awesome promises he gives us is that we can have peace in whatever we're faced in life. Now, I want you to get this one down. I want you to turn to Psalm 92 because... Here is certainly one that a lot of people uh, need to uh, think about. Because here is a promise that many people are certainly not living by, because if they were, uh, you could see it. And that is the promise that you and I can be, listen, watch this, that we can be strong and fruitful in old age. Now, a lot of folks, they get to about 55 or 57 or 60, and especially 65, when well, it's time to retire. Well, now who said so? Number one. Secondly, well, you know, after, after I'm getting tired, and so I'll just relax and take it easy and, and, and just slow down. Well, what does the Word of God say? In other words, is that, is that reality? Is that what God wants? Because there are many people who do their best work after they're 65 years of age. So what kind of a promise do I have about getting old? Well, first of all, let me ask you this. What is old? I can tell you what it is. <laughs> Not as old as it used to be. <laughs> Listen to this passage. Psalm 92. Verse 12. The righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. I'm coming back to that. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Now, a palm tree flourishes with fruit. Coconuts. Coconuts, coconuts, coconuts. Flourish like a palm tree will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Lebanese cedars are straight up and down. Their limbs are straight out like this. They're just beautiful examples and pictures of strength. Listen to what he says. The righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap and very green to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Now, here's the promise of God. Here's what he promises. First of all, what's old? It's the way a person thinks. And he says, look, even in old age, you can be like this flourishing, flourishing, growing, fruitful palm tree. Blows with the wind. Doesn't have any roots. But... The cedars of Lebanon, straight up, powerful. Root goes straight down. Stand all kind of storms. He said, that's the way God's people can live out their lives. 
And that is that no matter what your age may be, you can be fruitful, he says, and flourishing. And when he, when he talks about the idea of sap, he says, they shall be full of sap and very green. What does that mean? That means the energy that is in a growing plant, the sap is flowing, something's going on. So why do you want to get old when you don't have to get old? Because old, in other words, age doesn't mean necessarily old. Because notice how he says this. He says, uh, the righteous man will flourish in the like a palm tree, grows like a seed in Lebanon, plant in the house of the Lord, flourish in the courts of our God, still yield fruit in old age, full of sap and very green. What is it saying? He says, the righteous man, the righteous woman, the righteous man and woman has the privilege of living a life that is fruitful no matter what the age may be, and they can be strong no matter what the age is. Full of sap means energy, strength, bearing fruit, still making a difference, whatever it may be. So I would just simply ask you, when do you want to get old? We have to choose. Are we going to, are we going to claim His promise? And if you claim His promise today, God, I know that you can call me home in time you get ready, but until then, I want to give it my best. I want to be strong. I want to be fruitful. I want my life to count for the kingdom of God. And then look in Psalm 37. And uh, because here's a wonderful promise of God. If I should say to you, would you like to have the desires of your heart? If I said to you, what are the desires of your heart? Somebody says, well, I want a husband. Uh, I want a, a wife. I want this. I want that. What are the desires of your heart? Here's what God says. This is a promise from Almighty God who has all power. And listen, He has unconditional love for you. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. In other words, what does it mean to be delighted in Him? Look at that passage. Read it a little bit. Ask God to show you. What does it mean to delight yourself in Him? Ultimate simply means this. Above everything in my, else in my life that's important, my relationship with Him is the most important thing. I am delighted in serving Him. I'm delighting in worshiping Him. I'm delighting in giving Him. I'm, I'm delighted in living out a godly life. He says, delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Then you say, well, what about, what about when we face troubles? Uh, real troubles, difficulties, and so forth. What's his promise? Look in Psalm 46 and verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth should change and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake and swell in pride, and so forth. The reason I remember that verse of Scripture, this is the, this is the influence one school teacher had on me in the eighth grade that I've never forgotten. Every morning we started our class, she read the 46th Psalm and a number of verses, but primarily she always emphasized this one. God is our refuge. Watch this. Where do you run when you're in trouble? God is our refuge, a place to run in time of trouble, and our strength. What's the source of your strength? Hey, watch this. I love this. He didn't say a help in time of trouble. He said a very present help, which means no matter when and where and what, present. Why? Living on the inside of us. We have the promise of His presence, the promise of His strength, the promise of His help, no matter what we are facing in life. No one can promise us that but Almighty God. And then, for example, if you go back to Psalm 32, Listen to what he says. I love this passage because we all need it. He promises to give us direction for our life. In the eighth verse, I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Think about, the, think about what a possession that is. What a promise that is that God will give you direction any time in your life you need it. Here's the promise. I will instruct you and teach you the way which you should go. I will counsel you. Listen to this. Not from a distance. He says, I will counsel you with my eye on you. That is, I know where you are. I know where you're headed. I know what's ahead. I know the things you, pitfalls. I know the things that's dangerous. He says, I will give you direction and guidance for your life. That's an awesome promise of Almighty God. And every single believer has that promise. Then he says, for example, a passage that many people don't believe. 
we have the promise of healing in time of sickness. Look at the 103rd Psalm. Look at that first verse. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none, listen, and forget none of his benefits. What are they? Who pardons all our iniquities. Who heals all your diseases. Now, let me ask you a question. When we talk about the attributes of God, the attributes of God is one of them. He, is, he's, uh, he never changes. He's immutable. He never changes. So did he heal people in the Old Testament? Yeah. Did he heal people in the New Testament? Yes. Does he heal people past the New Testament? Yes. Does he heal people today? Yes. Then if we believe that, why do we have a little sore throat or have a little sniffle and we want to run to the doctor for antibiotics? What about running to Jesus? You say, now, are you against doctors? Absolutely not. God calls them to be physicians. And Paul had Luke along with him. But what I want you to see is this. I think God would heal many things and many things about us if we stopped and reminded him of what he said. He who heals all our diseases. Now, either he quit in Jesus' day or Paul's day, or he's still doing it. Now, the reason he's still doing it is because he can't change. And we're, we're just as much children of God as the Apostle Paul or anybody else. Think about how simple this is. Now, this part, this part we believe. Who forgives all our sins. Amen? Amen. That's not loud enough. Amen? Amen? What about this part? Who heals all our diseases. Amen. Mm -hmm. Sounds a little bit low on that one. <laughs> but, you know what? We don't even realize what we let the world do to us. We say, well, now I know that I, I know, I, I, yeah, well, I, mm -hmm. I, I believe that. Well, do we, do we believe the healing as much as we believe the other part, that he, that he forgives our sin? Let me ask you a question. Which cost God the most, healing my sins of my physical body? All of it got wrapped up in what happened at Calvary. I simply want you to see this. We have possessions. We have all these promises, and his promises, he, for example, he says, I sent my word, and with my word I healed them. My word will not return to me void. I'm simply saying, we have promises we don't even think about cashing in. Now, most people want to pray about something and some physical ailment when the doctors have said it's all over or something very serious. Why don't we talk to him first? Because we have grown up. And we've been acclimated, and we've been told, we've been warned, and we've been scared. The truth is, God is the great healer. Does that mean that nobody's going to die? No, it doesn't mean that. But it means we can be healthy and strong until the Lord finishes with us. Then it doesn't make any difference what happens, because think about this. If we have all these promises here, what about going to heaven and being in the presence of God? Then, of course, look in Romans 8. When I think about the awesome promise in Romans 8, and that is uh, the fact that nothing can separate us from the awesome love of God. Listen to what he says in this passage. And here's a promise. Now, many people, don't, they, don't, they don't really believe this. Listen to this. He says in verse 38, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Think about this. You have the awesome gift of God's unconditional love within your life. Nobody can promise you that but God. Now, you may want this person to love you or that person, but look who loves you. And he says, besides that, and he named all these things, nothing can separate you from the love of God. That's a, that's a possession you have. You possess the love of Almighty God that will never change. Then if you will turn to um, John chapter 10 for a moment, and here is his awesome promise of eternal security. Listen to what he says. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give to them eternal life, and they will never perish. He didn't say except, if, and, but, when, where. They will never perish, 
and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who gave them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Think about what you possess. You possess the gift of eternal life. Watch this. Nothing, no one, no time, nothing can alter that under any condition. You are a child of God. You are eternally secure. You live in sin, then there's some other promises about chastisement and discipline. But we're talking about the promise God has given you, that you are eternally secure. And I spent almost two hours talking with someone this week who was totally convinced and persuaded that when you die, uh, for example, that you uh, did not believe in eternal security, number one. When you die, uh, what happens is you go to the grave. I said, you mean you don't believe you die and go to be with Jesus? No, you die and you go to sleep. Now, where did you get that? I knew where they got it from. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul talks about being asleep in Jesus. But that's a term he uses in order to describe how a Christian uh, dies. That is, you went to bed last night, you went to sleep, you became unconscious, woke up this morning, a whole new day. Some of you woke up late, but you, but you woke up this morning. <laughs> and so, what did Paul mean by that? He was simply describing how the Christian lives. So we went on talking about um, that, and I just let that other person just go on and on and on telling me uh, why they believed what they believed and so forth. And I said, well, I wonder if I could just give you one verse of Scripture, maybe two. Listen to this. Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, which simply meant this. For me to live is for Christ to keep living in and through me. But for me to die is to be my gain. But if I'm to live on in this flesh, this will remain faithful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. He says, on the one hand, I just want to die and be with Jesus. On the other hand, I want to stay here and preach the gospel. He says, for I have the desire to depart and be with Christ, but that's very much better. Yet to remain on the flesh is more necessary for your sake. And I said to her, I said, listen, do you think the Apostle Paul meant that he wanted to die and get buried in a casket and covered up with six foot of dirt and be there sleeping for 2,000 years? Is that what he meant? It's like the light suddenly dawned. No. He said, absent from the body, present with the Lord. This death business. In other words, what would, what would a pastor say at a memorial service if that were true? That when you die, uh, you, get, you, you go sleep, to sleep for 2,000 years. It wouldn't make any difference what the pastor said. But he'd have to end up saying, well, our dearly beloved one who's gone to be, uh, uh, he has to stop and think, oh, gone to be placed in the grave, covered up with six feet of dirt. One of these days, maybe 2,000 years from now, six months from now, uh, we'll see him again. There would be nothing consoling in that whatsoever. Paul said, here's the issue. I want to stay here and preach the gospel so you will keep on growing in your Christian life. On the other hand, I want to die and be with Jesus. If he'd have thought that had been any other choice, he would have named it. He didn't. It's to die and be with the Lord. That's one of the awesome promises you and I have. That it's absent from the body, present with the Lord. Listen, who can, who can give you that promise? Only Almighty God could. Then I would give you one last. We, we, we could do this all day long, but I'm, I'm going to stop in a few moments. <laughs> But what I want you to see is, is what you possess, what you have. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm coming again to receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, period. We have the promise of heaven. Now think about this. You possess as your own awesome, unchangeable, eternal promises from Almighty God who rules all things. And every single one of these promises, listen, is given to every one of His children the moment that they're saved. Then the problem is that oftentimes people live their whole life and never gain enough information, enough knowledge, enough experience to realize what's theirs. What I want you to see is simply this. A promise from God is an awesome thing. And my challenge to you is simply this. Claim what is yours. 
And when, whatever you're facing in life, remember who you are, a follower of Jesus, and how rich you are. And listen, and the awesome capacity you have to serve him with all of your heart in a way that you will never grow old, but you'll be flourishing and fruitful and strong all the days of your life. Amen. 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 Father, how grateful we are this morning for the wonderful promise of your word. And what makes it so wonderful is the fact that we know it'll never change. You'll never change. We can't even begin to think of anything we need that you haven't covered. So we say thank you this morning, and I pray that you'll show us so, how to so live that people who are spiritually in poverty will want to know what is the source of our riches, and we can tell them in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've been blessed by today's program, please visit us at intouch.org.